Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Trenchless Technology webinar series. My name is Mike Kesdi, Associate Editor for Trenchless Technology, and it is my pleasure to introduce our presentation, Spiral Wound Liners Leading Edge Technology. We're going to take a quick poll, so please submit your answer and then click the blue Return to Presentation button. As a reminder, any views or opinions presented in this webinar are solely those of the presenters and do not necessarily represent those of Benjamin Media Inc., nor does Benjamin Media Inc. endorse any products or methods presented. Presenting today is Sean Melville and Klaus Langenbach of Sekasui SPR. Sean Melville has been with Sekasui for 22 years, initially as a civil engineer for direct ferry pipe applications, but most recently as general manager of rehabilitation. He oversees manufacturing, quality assurance, and plant maintenance departments in addition to engineering duties. Sean is a member of ASTM F-17 and ISO TC-138-SC8 for standards development relating to pipeline rehabilitation. His background is in civil engineering, where he earned his degree from Adelaide University in Australia. Klaus Langenbach has been with Sekasui for 16 years starting as a project manager. He later became company director for Spiral Wound Liners in Asia before becoming vice president of operations for SPR Americas here in the United States in 2015. He has 21 years experience in the pipe rehab industry, starting at Canal Miller in Germany in 1997, while spending most of his career in Singapore and Hong Kong since 1998, and in the US since 2015. He holds a chemical engineering degree from the University of Karlsruhe in Germany. Following the presentation, there will be a question and answer session. We encourage you to participate by typing your question into the designated panel in the left-hand portion of your screen. You can also maximize your viewing window by clicking the box with the X at the upper right of the slides. Now please welcome today's speakers, Klaus and Sean. Well, thank you very much, Mike. Um, my name is Klaus Langenbach, and um, we're very honored uh, to present um, to all of you um, spiral wound liners, uh, which we believe is a leading edge technology. Um, thanks very much for everybody participating in today's webinar, and uh, we're looking forward to receiving questions uh, throughout the presentation, which we will then answer in the Q&A session afterwards. Um, today's presentation um, outline will be um, uh, gravity pipeline rehabilitation, a short introduction there before I pass over to Sean who will then go into the technical details of the presentation um, and uh, he will cover an overview of the technology, go into design considerations, uh, talk about features and benefits of the spiral wound liners uh, before we go to typical, typical installation case studies. Um, and um, we, um, as you know, we, we have a couple of um, trenchless uh, technology, technologies available in the market. Uh, CIPP is probably one of them that you, that you all heard about. Um, we, we, we have pipe bursting, slip lining, spray on lining like uh, the epoxies and geopolymers. Um, and today's presentation is really about spiral wound liners um, only. And I'm handing over to Sean now. Good afternoon, everybody. Now, we're going to be focusing primarily on machine wound spiral wound liners. Um, there are other techniques hand applied, but again, for this presentation, we're primarily going to focus on the machine wound liners. So we're going to talk about the history of spiral wound liners, a brief process description of the various options, describing the PVC materials and the installation methods. Following that, we're going to talk about design considerations, features and benefits, and typical installation, and then we'll hand back to Klaus to talk about some of the case studies. So a brief history of spiral wound liners. Um, there's approximately 30 years of installation history. The technology originated primarily out of Australia and then Japan in the 1980s. We first introduced the technology into the United States in 1996 and around the world 
we've got approximately 20 million feet installed and 3 million feet installed within the US. Spiral arm providers, obviously we have Sekasui SPR Americas. Within the US, we have Contech Engineered Solutions for the PE line of product. There are other spiral wound technology providers, such as Danby Pipe Renovation and SWP. Now, on spiral wound liners, the technology involves a PVC or a HDP profile strip with a continuously sealed spiral joint. It is extruded in a factory environment and then shipped site, and some of the technologies have optional steel reinforcing strips for fixed diameter and some close fit solutions where additional structural strength is required. In the factory, we extrude the profile and we spool it onto large drums, which are then transported to site. The spools are located above ground and they're powered on driven skates, hydraulically driven. And the profile comes from these spools with the different technologies and is fed through manholes to the machinery which is installed in place. The winding machines that we're going to talk about primarily today, we have three different machines. We have an SPR EX machine. Um, the range of that is typically between 6 inch and at the upper end 42 inches. We have an SPR TF machine, which is a machine that traverses the pipeline and lays a liner behind it. We also have an SPR TM machine, and a particular machine shown here in this slide is also a traversing machine. So we have options where we can install from a static machine in the base of a manhole, pushing out a liner, or we have the machines that traverse the pipeline, leaving the liner behind them. There are close fit solutions, and there are also fixed diameter grouted solutions. The installed liner is a hydraulically sealed, fully structural pipe. The smooth inner surface of a plastic liner provides improved hydraulic capacity. The loss in cross section is typically countered by that improved flow capacity ca uh, characteristic. And we typically design for a 50 year design life. Now, the PVC profile. It's a UPVC material. It meets the minimum cell classification requirements within ASTM F1697. There are a few different profiles which are covered by that particular standard, um, depending on the particular application. The PVC profiles are sealed via a mechanical lock. Now, the sealant materials are primarily factory applied, and the QA for such a PVC profile is really done in the factory. And the benefit of this is that it's a mechanical installation process. There's no thermal processes and so on going on on site. The PVC profile does vary with the installation method. The particular profile that's shown on this particular slide is for the SPRTM method. And in any case, there are options with and without steel reinforcement. There are particular profiles that are designed for close fit expandable applications. There are also profiles designed to be laid in close contact with the host pipe as a machine traverses the line, and profiles designed to be installed at a fixed diameter, in which case the annular space between the liner and the host pipe is grouted. The mechanical lock in between each successive wrap of PVC profile. There's a sealing material that is factory applied. In the case of the SPREX technology, there is lubricating sealant applied on site. At any rate, the liners are designed to prevent any infiltration. They are past the requirements of various standard requirement tests for pressure testing. This next example for SPRTF profile, what we have here is one of the examples that is a PVC only profile. 
There is an option for SPRTF that does include steel reinforcement for a greater long-term stiffness. Once again, this particular material can be steel reinforced. It is an expandable product. It can be laid in close contact with a host pipe. Now, the difference between the testing technologies, it was mentioned before that we have the option to place a machine in the base of a manhole and essentially push out a liner, so a fixed machine. In effect, this is more or less an advanced form of slip lining, in which way we are able to push out a liner and then, through a mechanical process, radially expand it to form a close fit liner with the existing host pipe. So the winding machine is placed at the entry at the point of the host pipe at the bottom of the manhole. We wind profile through the machine to push out a liner pipe in either direction, upstream or downstream. The traverse winding method employs a machine that we place at the beginning of a line and it forms a liner as the machine travels the length of the host pipe simultaneously interlocking the profile to form the liner. The PVC profile is pulled and winding occurs within the pipe. Now we're going to talk a little bit about design considerations. The design for machine-wound spiral PVC liners is conducted in accordance with ASTM F1741 which only recently was revised this year, and that includes options for fully deteriorated pipes and partially deteriorated, and also composite design systems, most often used for non-circular applications. So again, the ASTMs. There are two ASTMs associated with the PVC machine spiral wound liners. There is ASTM F1697, which is the standard specification for PVC profile strip for machine spiral wound liner pipe, rehabilitation of existing sewers and conduit. This is essentially the material specification for any materials used in accordance with this method. Then there is ASTM F1741, which is the standard practice for installation of machine spiral wound PVC liner pipes for the rehabilitation of existing sewers and conduit. This standard includes the installation method and also within the appendices, the methods for design. In addition to these standards, which I must say are used in approximately 70% of our applications around the world, it's not just used within the United States, it's used frequently throughout Asia throughout the Middle East, throughout South Africa, for example, this particular ASTM suite of standards is used for design. Additionally, there are other standards applied internationally. The ATV DVWK M127E is a standard originating out of Germany and is used within Germany and Austria, for example. But even in that case, they do resort to the ASTMs when composite liners are employed, i.e. steel reinforced liners. Additionally, there's the WR2, uh, WRC Type 2 philosophy, which is for a standalone unbonded structural liner. These products are approved, WRC approved, and those approvals reference the ASTM design methods as the WRC the Sewer Rehabilitation Manual, the SRM, does not actually provide a method for design with profiled wall pipes. In Australia, we do actually use a variant where part of a direct berry pipe standard is employed in addition to using the ASTM for the, deteriorated, uh, the partially deteriorated design condition. Of course, the global market can be quite fractured in certain areas, and other countries do have their own national standards which they do employ. For example, France has its own standard. Okay, on ASTM F1741, 
the fully deteriorated pipe condition, which frankly is what we do most of our designs in accordance to. It, this is where the existing pipe is not structurally sound and cannot support the soil surcharge and life loads, or is expected to reach this condition over the design life of the spiral arm liner pipe. This condition is evident when sections of the existing pipe are missing, the existing pipe has lost its original shape, or the existing pipe is corroded due to the effects of the fluid, atmosphere, or soil. In short, the liner has to be designed to resist all applied loads, soil, superimposed dead load, vehicle loads, and hydrostatic loads. And you see there an example of the calculation coming from the annex within the ASDM. The partially deteriorated design condition. This is where the existing pipe can actually support the soil and surcharge and live loads throughout the design life of the rehabilitated pipe. And the soil adjacent to the existing pipe can provide adequate side support. The conduit may have longitudinal cracks and some distortion of the diameter. In short, the liner within such a pipe must be designed to resist the hydrostatic load applied by the water table only. All other loads are resisted by the existing pipe. It is important to carefully consider the water table information provided, including what time of year any information was gathered, i.e. the potential differences between the end of summer and the end of winter. In particular, there have been instances where people have specified a particular water table, and that water table has been for a short-term consideration, a flood condition. Now, whilst that may be the worst case, that sort of requirement is a short-term requirement, not a 50-year design requirement. It is important to consider the difference. On this particular slide, you see an example of the particular equation used within the design standard for the partially deteriorated condition. Composite designs. Now, designing composite product liners this is where you have a high strength structural mortar, is not quite so simple to boil down to a, a few pages within a design standard. And so within the ASTM, it says for non-circular pipe, arched, oval, or rectangular shaped pipes, or a combination thereof, that a design of the spiral wound liner pipe for these non-circular shaped pipes is complex and specific to each situation. The manufacturer shall be consulted for design recommendations for the rehabilitation of non-circular pipes. In larger sizes of non-circular pipes, a reinforcing framework for the steel reinforced profile strip liner may have to be temporarily installed to support the live grout load. In essence, the design approach here is quite often one that requires finite element analysis. Now, we move to features and benefits of spiral wound liners. One of the advantages of spiral wound liners is an improved flow characteristic. We employ a Manning's end value of 0 0.009 within our designs. This, of course, is supported by test data in both laminar and turbulent flow conditions in which we have established values ranging from 0.008 to 0.0094, and in keeping with industry expectations on most plastic pipes, we employ that Manning's end value of 0.009. Now, of course, this is for a new liner. One of the advantages of spiral arm liners is that you are producing a liner that does have a circular bore. It's a mechanically installed liner there's no thinning or possibility of folds or anything like that within the liner. So such a flow characteristic is essentially guaranteed by the installation. Now, corrosion and chemical resistance. We employ a pipe grade PVC resin material and the corrosion and chemical resistance has been tested successfully 
with all relevant ASTMs and regional standards, for example, the Green Book Pickle Jar Test. The PVC Profile Lock. Now, once again, there are a variety of tests that are required around the world. Here within the US, and as specified by the ASTMs, there's an internal pressure, hydrostatic pressure, and a vacuum test that is conducted. This requires the liner to withstand a pressure of 74 kPa in a straight orientation, in a 10 degree bend orientation, and also with a 5% deflection applied to the liner in three separate tests for the internal hydrostatic and the vacuum. Now these tests have been conducted by a variety of labs as well as routinely conducted as part of our QA requirements within the production facility. This mechanical lock does provide a continuous tight seal impervious to water or root intrusion. In effect, if your liner isn't sealing, then it's not really rehabilitating a damaged pipe. The structural integrity, again, we designed for a fully structural solution, typically for a 50 year design life. This is determined through long term testing of the structural strength of the liners. It is possible and has been done in isolated cases to design for a different design life by extending such creep data. But again, most standards do require a 50 year design life. It has been tested um, for earthquake resistance in certain markets. And once again, in isolated cases, we have seen the benefit of that. It's been employed, for example, very heavily within the New Zealand market after the earthquakes that affected the Christchurch area, where they were looking specifically for earthquake resistant liners. One of the other benefits of spiral wound liners, once again, it's a mechanical installation process involving no chemical or thermal processes, and as such, installations can take place in live flow environments. The flow can go through the machine and through the liner during installation. Now, there are a variety of situations that we find ourselves with on site. There are some times where it might be, there might be too much flow, in which case flow can be stored up and then wind can be paused, for example, to allow flow to continue through the line to release that backlog of flow and winding can proceed. Again, the mechanical installation process. The profile is manufactured in a factory environment. All quality control measures can take place in that environment, knowing that when the profile is taken to site, what you have, what you see is what you will get. The PVC profile is locked into pipe on site with repeatable mechanical properties. The site conditions do not impact the product quality. No site excavation. Now we say here 100% trenchless. There are of course occasions where some excavation is required, for example, in some applications with offset manholes and with otherwise inaccessible lines where minimal excavation is required, but typically in 99% of applications, I would say, there is no excavation required. And as with all forms of trenchless technology, the intention really is to minimize social impact avoiding large excavations and disrupting the uh, community around you. Benefits of spiral arm liners. It's an environmentally friendly process and material. It is styrene and VOC free. There are no unpleasant odors, at least not from the installation or of the material. Of course, sewers have their own um, odors that we can't really do much with. There's no wastewater or other waste products. And there are minimal fuel requirements for operating the machines on site, leading to a small carbon footprint. Now, typical installation. We're gonna talk about the installation methods for three of the technologies. 
and the steps within those installation methods. SPR-EX. It's um, a static winding machine installed at the base of a manhole. It winds out a liner at a fixed diameter and expands it so it becomes a tight fit liner, not requiring any grout. And used typically for 6 to 42 inch circular applications. Here we see an example of an installation that's halfway through. As mentioned, 6 inch to 42 inch capabilities. It forms the liner and pushes the liner downstream at a fixed diameter and through a particular process. It then severs a sacrificial lock and through this process we feed more profile in to progressively radially expand the liner to form a close contact liner with the host pipe. We will be showing a video of this a little bit later in the presentation. SPRTF, it's a traverse winding method. Once again, it's forming a tight fitting liner without grout and used typically for 40 inch to 60 inch circular applications. Now we've introduced this to the US this year. It has been in development for some time and we are looking to further develop it for other particular applications. But typically speaking, what happens is the equipment traverses the host pipe while the profile strip locks together. There's no annular space remaining between the host pipe and the liner. And therefore, because you have that continuous contact with the host pipe, you're not requiring any grout to transmit the loads to and from the liner. Now, the SPRTF profile contains three seals that are engaged during winding. There's hot melt sealants and a Santa Cruz O ring gasket within the lock. The third method, SPRTM, can be used in either configuration. There's a, a traversing machine, obviously used for non circular applications, and a static winding machine that can be employed for circular applications. It does require grout to fill the annular space. Again, there is the possibility where for non-circular applications, this is a high strength structural mortar and the design is essentially as a rigid pipe. Now for circular applications, depending on the requirements of design, it can be designed as a rigid pipe employing that high strength structural grout or alternatively, it can be designed as a flexible liner in which case you employ a low strength cementitious mortar, which is a void filler essentially to fix the liner in place, to prevent any point loads acting on the liner, and also to transmit loads to and from the liner. As we've stated, typically used for applications between 36 inches and 216 inches, circular and non circular applications. We see a particular image of one. SPRTM configuration in a rectangular pipeline. As mentioned, can be installed either in a static or traversing configuration. Obviously, the static configuration must be circular. Any non circular application does require a traversing winding machine. There is an annular space which must be filled with the grout. We also have profiles that are able to allow this machinery and the resulting liner to negotiate particular radius bends depending on the profile that's employed, a radius of um, five times the diameter or 10 times the diameter with some profiles. Now, we are going to show a typical installation video. This will run for approximately one minute and there'll be a slight voiceover, so we'll see you after the video. There are three methods for installing spiral wound liners that vary by pipe diameter and shape. SPRTM is a solution for large diameters able to renew round and non-round shapes. SPRTF rehabilitates mid-range diameter pipelines. 
The PVC liner is wound directly against the pipe wall by a traversing machine, resulting in a tight fit. For small diameters between 6 and 42 inches, there's SBREX. The PVC liner is wound by a static machine that sits at the host pipe entrance. SBREX is initially installed at a fixed diameter. Once the liner reaches the far end manhole, the expansion process begins. Wire within the liner is pulled, severing the sacrificial lock inside the profile. This process travels back towards the winding machine. This enables successive wraps of PVC profile to expand against each other, increasing the liner's diameter to fit tightly against the hose pipe. Okay, with any luck, everyone's videos have concluded. Have to sometimes allow for different uh, speeds and so on, any lag. The typical installation steps. Pre-installation, we require a pipe to be cleaned and inspected. The laterals are located and logged prior to winding. Again, it's a PVC strip that is installed through a mechanical process. There's no pressure involved, so it's not going to deform out into any voids in the pipe, including lateral openings. The insulation process, in which the strip of profile is fed from the spool above ground to the machine, either in the base of the manhole or traversing the pipeline, and so the liner is constructed on site within the pipe. Post installation. Laterals are reinstated. Now, whether that happens absolutely immediately or whether clients sometimes require a low pressure test, which can happen. Um, again, my experience is that certain clients who have had extensive experience with it, some are quite comfortable with the ceiling capacity and value reinstating of the lateral connections for their uh, residents as quickly as possible. The liner ends are cut and sealed using a variety of methods, hydrophilic foam and epoxies, mortar grouts, and so forth. Now, I'm going to hand back over to Klaus, who's going to run through some case studies, and we'll have time to run through these in some detail. Okay, thank you very much, Sean. Um, I think that was a wonderful explanation of our technologies. Um, you probably noticed uh, Sean is from Australia, and that's what, where the technology also originates. Um, and so most of the um, projects that have been installed worldwide come from the Southern Hemisphere. And um, uh, But um, being um, a company in the United States and representing our team here, um, we wanted to um, show two project um, case studies um, that we are very proud of. And um, the first one is in California, in um, Newport Beach. And um, we we actually did a, a new, we did a project there using the um, expander technology, and um, we rehabilitated around 40 culverts. Um, a di diameter ranging from 12 to 24 inch. Um, the challenges um, in that particular area were that the location was in an ecological reserve, so extremely sensitive area in terms of wildlife and um, um, flora there as well. Um, the pipe location was difficult to access um, and um, so uh, chemical components were not really allowed on site. Um, and we were struggling uh, there with monitoring tidal flows. Um, so the owner came uh, to us um, looking for a technology that is not affected by flow conditions. Um, and again, we, we, we could utilize our technology, um, the EX technology, where uh, flow was acceptable in the pipeline. Um, so we installed roughly 1,000 feet there. Um, you, you see a photo there. Um, of, uh, of the pipeline.
pipeline where we employed the EX with a machine right outside the pipeline, no real manholes, a uh, very sensitive area. Um, and um, I believe that um, this was actually uh, presented at uh, multiple national conferences last year as well. One of the um, other projects that we're very proud of was a project in uh, Kansas City. Uh, we um, employed the um, TM technology there. Um, it was a brick sewer, 125 years old, and the original diameter was 114 inch. And uh, one of the, the big problem there is that um, the, the pipeline was under heavy traffic, four lanes of uh, traffic downtown. Um, 35 feet deep, um, and the real uh, problem was the 90 degree bends. We had two sweeping bends uh, with uh, significant deflections at the crown of the pipe. And you can see the photo before and after. Uh, we um, were very proud of that, and we typically uh, showcase that many times. Um, we installed the liner, and afterwards it looks like that. Um, we reduced the diameter, and as Sean mentioned earlier, um, a reduction in diameter doesn't mean a reduction in flow capacity. It's actually the other way around. We reduced the diameter, uh, but uh, because of our uh, great manning factor, we increased the flow capacity nevertheless. Um, and yeah, this entire project was with minimal impact uh, to the public. We finished the project within two weeks, and when I say we, I mean our, um, our licensees that we employ throughout the country. Um, we're coming um, towards the end of the presentation now, and um, yeah, I'm looking forward to the questions, but um, just want to run through one more time um, the benefits of spiral-wound liners in general. Um, one of the big, biggest benefit and um, advantage that um, we can bring to, to our customers is that we can install in live flow conditions, typically without any bypass. And um, as Sean mentioned, yes, sometimes we, uh, we have to stop the flow, and maybe that is to install the machine properly, but that's just for a short period of time. And typically during the winding and the installation process, um, the flow can continue as usual. We also provide improved flow characteristics. Um, as I mentioned just one slide ago, we have an in a decrease of diameter, but we, we, we always make sure that we have an improved flow characteristic after the rehabilitation process. Um, it's a mechanical process, so um, there's no deviations in mechanical or physical properties of the final product. Um, everything is uh, factory manufactured, so uh, what, what, as Sean mentioned, uh, uh, described it, what you see is what you get, and um, there's um, no deviation in our uh, material properties. Corrosion uh, resistance, um, that is a must for all technologies, I believe, um, and no site excavation. And I would like to add a little bit here to the no site excavation. Uh, typically, that's the case for most technologies in small diameters, but the bigger you get, the more excess you need. Uh, to get down to the pipe. With our technology, um, or with spiral wound technologies in general, you will find that you only need to lower a profile strip into the manhole and use existing access chambers without the need of any excavation, really. Um, we have proven that our PVC profiles, um, um, that the lock integrity, uh, there's se severe testing done uh, um, at third parties, so we're very proud of that, that we are having a non-leaking system. Um, and um, yeah, structural integrity, I think that's a, that's a given for all technologies, really. And uh, we also follow our standards, ASCM uh, 1741, uh, to provide designs to any end user um, accordingly. That's it for our presentation now, and um, I think we have received a couple of questions which we're um, happy to answer. I believe when I look at the overall amount of questions, we won't be able to answer all of them, but um, we'll go through and um, um, hope to satisfy um, um, those, and um, if not, uh, we're probably happy to um, communicate even after.
after the webinar um, on questions that haven't been answered. Um, I think I'll pass back to Mike now um, to moderate us through the remaining session. Thank you, Klaus and Sean. That was an informative uh, webinar, and you're right. It is now time for the Q&A portion of the presentation. As a reminder to our attendees, you can enter questions in the panel in the left-hand portion of your screen. Uh, the first question we have here is, is the technology applicable to asbestos cement pipe? Now, again, asbestos is a very sensitive topic. It has come up um, in the past. Now, we have had queries about such applications, and obviously our primary concern is for the safety of our operators. We really do have to evaluate projects on a case-by-case -case basis. Whilst it is a wet environment, and as such, you, know, you don't have so much problem with loose fibers, the fact is you're installing a liner and there is movement in, within those pipelines. And so really we have to be very cautious about those sort of applications. And it's purely from the standpoint of operator safety. Um, all right, it, kind of expanding on that, what are the access requirements? What, what type of access and access space is needed to perform a typical spiral wound rehabilitation? Okay, well, we might um, throw between Klaus and myself for some of these uh, questions, obviously, but the equipment itself is all designed to be able to be dismantled um, so as to be passed through standard access uh, points. You know, typically we're talking um, as small as uh, 22 inches, 550 millimeters thereabouts. Standard manholes are typically 600 millimeters or 24 inches. And so we disassemble the machines, pass them through these manholes, down the shafts into the chambers where those machines can be assembled again. Now, space required within the manhole itself, the chamber, does vary. Obviously, with small diameter lines, you typically have very small chambers. You don't require a great deal of information there, uh, a great deal of uh, space there, but I'll hand over to class for a moment. Um, well, I think there, there was, so we, we even received another question which goes to the same subject line, 24 inches, typ the, the typical size of our manholes here and uh, the manhole openings, and our machines are usually designed to fit through the 24-inch opening. Um, uh, certain components, as Sean mentioned, will have to be dismantled, but it's a very easy process to fix them up together again at the bottom of the manhole. Um, especially the static winding machines where you have large size uh, pipes, uh, where you, we need a winding cage right at the bottom. The cage is typically the size of the diameter of the pipe or slightly smaller, and that can be dismantled and fixed back together at the beginning of the pipe. In some cases, there will be some work required within the manhole. Um, as Klaus mentioned, cage sizes uh, may require a small amount of chop out and then subsequent reinstatement within the manholes, but this is a relatively quick process. I hope that All answers right. the question. Uh, can you explain a little more on how the service laterals are reconnected after the spiral wound liner is used? Yeah, absolutely. Um, typically, we, um, we, we, we're doing it like uh, most other rehab technologies as well. Um, the laterals will be locked um, by CCTV, I would say, uh, before the rehabilitation process. Um, for uh, our technology, you have to imagine that we are installing a profile um, that, uh, that doesn't transform its shape during the installation. So we need to know exactly where they are and we have uh, particular methods of how to lock the laterals before we line. And with that logging method, we can then identify the location of the laterals afterwards and open them up again. Um, when Once they are open, it's uh, like any other technology, um, we always advise to seal the lateral with um, whatever methods are available in the market, whether it's cosmic or top head, or um, there, there are a couple of them that are 
uh, applicable for uh, CIPP, for example, and the same applies to the spiral wound liners as well. Uh, going back to the access uh, discussion, particularly for the winding machine option, how much access space is required? Um, I, I think that was um, already covered just now, uh, Mike. That um, mm -hmm. you know, access space um, it is is really the typically the the space in the manual in front of the pipe is sufficient for the machine to wind. Um, and um, all our components are uh, built that they fit through a 24-inch standard opening. Mm. And if we're talking about the SPR EX technology, the small diameter technology, at the base of the manhole, that equipment is operated by a person. And so, once again, we've we've had well, plenty of experience with this. And the typical manhole chambers, even at small diameter, are more than adequate for the expander equipment and the operator, one operator at that base of the manhole. Right. At the beginning of the presentation, you mentioned the lifespan is generally designed to be 50 years. Is it possible to have a liner designed and tested for a 75 to 100 year lifespan? Absolutely. Um, again, the one important clarification is design life and service life. The design life comes into the, the structural design, in which case we typically use an effective 50-year long-term stiffness. We have done the long-term testing according to um, ISO methods, according to the ISO standard. Now, that's typically out to 50 years, but the data can, with a sufficient degree of correlation, be extended out further. We have, for example, I, I do recall that we have had one design where it required an 80-year design life as part of the design. And so, yes, that can be readily done. It just requires a further extrapolation of that creep test data. What is the maximum length that can be lined using with the SPR-EX? Okay, the SPREX method is, there's a, a few little limitations there. It does depend on diameter, for example. At larger diameters, the profile is delivered to site on drums, and we do have one limitation in that we do not do profile joining yet with the SPREX technology. So there is a limitation according to the amount of profile that can be installed on a spool in the factory and then taken to site. Again, that limitation is primarily for the upper end of the diameter range. It really does depend on diameter and how much material is required to do that particular line. At smaller diameters, the limitation is not so much the, uh, the profile capacity of the spools. It is driven by a few different things such as the alignment and the amount of load back onto the equipment. There are ways to mitigate that load and reduce that load, but our experience has told us that at various diameters, such as um, an 8-inch liner, 200-millimeter uh, diameter liner, I believe the maximum that we have done with EX um, is approximately a little bit under 600 feet, for example. We have done um, for the yeah, 600 feet or about 180 meters has been done at smaller diameters with the EX technology, as an example. Now, we do have some contractors that are challenging those limitations um, as time goes on. So that's not, as I said, it's not a hard and fast rule. A lot does depend on the liner, uh, the host pipe configuration and alignment. Uh, what is the typical reduction in pipe diameter? Well, the, the typical reduction in pipe diameter, I think um, it it's, depends, of course, on the design. Um, but our liner uh, thicknesses uh, start. Um, we have, we have probably five, six, uh, in yeah, six or seven profiles that we offer for uh, different load applications and uh, sizes of pipelines. But we 
the thickness um, in a let, let's take an eight inch liner for example um, we we do have a uh, a profile which is called eighty five seven there and um, so that, that goes uh, to a reduction um, in the, the thickness of the liner is then really um, seven millimeters. Um, but even there, uh, we typically show an increase in flow capacity um, after the um, relining process. So that was a seven millimeter waterway wall. So the diameter is obviously reduced by you know, the waterway wall all around the pipeline. Right. Yeah. Can the liner provide full structural replacement of the host pipe? Yes, it is designed in accordance with the ASTM standard, for example, to be, in most cases, a fully structural solution. Again, the ASTM does provide options for fully deteriorated and partially deteriorated conditions. But yes, it is designed to be a fully structural standalone liner. The ASTM standards do not consider any contributions from the existing host pipe. It is really all down to the liner to withstand the applied loads. Is the 74 kPa the maximum internal pressure that can be resisted by the liner? No, that's the requirement of the ASTM standard. Now again, the standards are for gravity flow applications. Now in certain circumstances, you can have small pressures in gravity flow applications, but they are designed for gravity, gravity flow applications and not for pressure applications. All right. are, are there materials of host pipe that are not compatible with the PVC material? No, they're, they're typically not. Um, we, well, so far we have not come across um, any examples of pipelines that are um, not applicable. I mean, we, we have, typically, typically you have uh, concrete pipe, clay pipes, um, CMP. um, CMP, and, and we, we have lined them all and um, with um, had some more severe, uh, badly deformed pipes as well where we had to install our liner, but the material itself, and even earlier we talked about asbestos cement, um, it's not an issue actually. From an installation perspective and from a design perspective, it's not an issue. Mm. For example, we have even done certain rehabilitation projects where there have been host pipe collapses and there have been lengths of three or four lengths of the host pipe that have had to be removed and we've wound the liner through that uh, empty space without the support of a host pipe. What is the Manning's equation for the liner once installed in a pipe? The Manning's equation or the Manning's factor? Manning's factor, sorry. Yeah. We employ a Manning's factor of 0 0.009. Um, I mentioned during the presentation that we have conducted testing of liners at small diameter in both laminar and turbulent flow conditions. Our testing achieved values ranging from 0 0.008 to 0 0.0094, and we employ 0 0.009 to be consistent with industry expectations for plastic pipes. All right. What is the amount of bracing required for the 216 inches during, in, during installation? Would that interfere with the flow? Um, no, it typically wouldn't. I mean, 216 inches is uh, obviously an extreme case where um, that, that's a real big pipe. But um, 216 inches, we, we would employ probably an eight point or even more. I, I would have to check design calculations, but uh, we need multiple points of bracing for, for the grouting process there. Um, but the design of those brace frames has been developed to such an extent that flow still can go through. Um, so it doesn't entirely block the pipe when we do that. Um, I don't have any pictures now, obviously, for this webinar, but uh, we, we can definitely provide some case studies there. The other important factor to, to go along with that is it does depend on the particular technology that is being installed. Um, and the process by which you do the grouting. 
for the SPRTM profile, as Klaus mentioned, you know, you'll have a multiple points of contact internal bracing. There are other technologies where simple beam and prop methods are used and people do employ stage grouting to minimize the amount of bracing required. It really does depend on the product application and the host pipe, the, uh, the design requirements there. Uh, continuing with the grouting discussion, we have a couple grouting questions here. What is the grout, grout strength and how do you ensure even grout distribution behind the liner for the SPR method? Um, well, grout, grouting strength is um, um, something Sean was um, alluding earlier on in the presentation as well. It, depending on, on the design, um, uh, we we we're using uh, sometimes we use a composite design and in the composite designs we do partially rely on the strength of the grouting material and here we it, it really depends on design by design uh, but we we have seen designs of 5000 or even 8000 psi um, now grouting only applies to the SPRTM technology um, and um, Depending on the diameter, we are actually able to use the ASTM flexible pipe design as well in accordance to ASTM F1741. And if that's the case, we can also use cellular grouts with a low strength. And um, so there are different, different requirements depending on the project. But I would say typically if you go bigger than a probably 100 inch, um, I would say that's the threshold route usually where we have to go to high strength grouting materials where the liner itself won't be able to absorb all the external forces anymore. Um, and then depending on the size and uh, the depth of the line, we 3,000, 5,000, 8,000 PSI. Um, that depends. Mm. Yeah, unfortunately it's probably not a question that we can do complete justice to in the time frame that's available. Right. So. Um, yeah. It really does depend on a case-by-case -case basis. And uh, quickly to the distribution of the grout, I think that was part of the question. Um, how do we ensure that the grouting material sits everywhere? Um, I, I think that's uh, the same question that applies to all slip lining methods as well. Um, we, we utilize grouting, uh, multiple grouting ports to ensure uh, through checking, bar, uh, checking bars as well that the grouting material has reached every single level of the pipeline. Um, it's hard to explain this now over the phone, but um, if you have done slip lining or any experience with slip lining, you can assume that we're doing the same thing. Okay. Uh, th this will be the last question for the webinar. Uh, is there any maintenance cost to the liner? Um, well, maintenance cost to the liner, I would say um, not, not as such, but um, I, I believe that most agencies, municipalities have their maintenance program and that cost does not increase or, um, um, because of our technology. I think it actually causes an, a decrease of your typical maintenance cost because of the um, flow coefficient that we are providing. Um, and therefore, um, no, there's, there's certainly no additional cost. If I can add to that, because it is one very important factor, after lining, it is important what cleaning equipment that you do use. After lining, as with most liners, we don't recommend the use of mechanical cleaning devices, chain flails and rotor routers and so on. We really do recommend water jetting um, and you know, we limit the, uh, the pressure from those water jets typically to 2,000 psi. It really is important not to use mechanical devices within rehabilitated pipes. All right. Well, that was the last question for the webinar portion, but we did have a lot of great questions that we did not get to address during this live portion of Q&A. Those will be addressed offline via email. Uh, thank you again, Sean and Klaus, for your participation. This concludes today's session of the Trenchless Technology Webinar Series. I'd also like to thank Sekasui for sponsoring the session. As a reminder, today's webinar will be archived at trenchlesstechnology.com if there is something you may have missed or would like to refer back to. 
Thank you again, and we look forward to seeing you online at a future Trenchless Technology webinar.